Well, it's a beautiful Saturday morning here in El Paso, Texas. It's um, just the right kind of uh, weather to be outside, working in the yard, uh, preparing the garden for summer, you know, things like that. But I've decided that instead I would rather remain indoors and talk about speciation. <laughs> it doesn't get more fun than that, right? So I'm on chapter, what is it, seven? of Jerry Coyne's Why Evolution is True, where he does talk about speciation. And he brings up a lot of different topics regarding what exactly a species is, how one species of animal uh, or plant diverges or branches off into two distinct species, uh, under what conditions, you know, what conditions need to be met in order for that to happen, how long does it take, do we observe species in in the in or do we observe speciation in the laboratory or in the wild? Uh, what about humans? Are uh, how do you define speciation uh, amongst humans, if 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 at all? You know, these are thorny problems. You know, and it's particularly when you're talking about human beings, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, sensitivity issues, obviously, uh, that need to be considered. So, what about it? Species turns out to be um, harder to define than than you might think at first. Um, it's kind of like trying to decide uh, languages on the borders of countries that speak similar languages. Let's say uh, French, Spanish, and Italian. Right? They're all Romance languages, but and they and they're all distinct. But what, are, what about around the borders of those countries? The languages themselves begin to get corrupted. Or what about, let's say, Spanish as it's spoken in Spain versus Spanish how it's spoken in Mexico? Um, you have a separation of the Atlantic Ocean, a huge separation, a huge barrier, so that the Spanish language was able to evolve separately from the mother country. So now what you have really is while it's still Spanish, it's 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 a unique brand of Spanish. It's it's a it's a different form. Um, is it still Spanish? Uh, well, maybe someday after it's allowed to evolve for uh, many more generations, the Spanish in Mexico may bear less and less resemblance to the Spanish as it's spoken back in Spain, back in the mother country. So we find the same kinds of issues with regard to languages, that's just an analogy, that you find in biology. Um, it turns out that speciation does have a lot to do with separation uh, along uh, in geography. Uh, we discussed that in a previous chapter. Well, a lot of this current chapter in speciation has to do with that. Species branch off or diverge when they are when you have a group of animals or plants that suddenly there is a geographic barrier placed between them or one group of animals moves around the geographic barrier and now they're isolated and so they're allowed to to evolve separate and distinct from each other because now they're both in separate environments as time goes on, uh, if those two distinct forms of animals, let's say they're now new species, are brought together, um, will they be able to interbreed? If they're not able to interbreed, then they have evolved separate from each other and you have two distinct species. That's how speciation occurs, at least according to Coyne. And uh, I find that convincing. So the definition that he uses for species was cooked up by uh, Ernst Mayer, and he uses that definition. Uh, he says that a species is a group of interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. And Coyne gives the example of some flowering plants that are split in two along a geographic barrier and are allowed to evolve separate from each other. Let me read what he says. 
Suppose, for example, that an ancestral species of flowering plant was split into two portions by a geographic barrier, like a mountain range. The species may, for example, have been dispersed over the mountains in the stomachs of birds. Now imagine that one population lives in a place having a lot of hummingbirds, but only a few bees. In that area, the flowers will evolve to attract hummingbirds as pollinators. Typically, the flowers would become red, which is a color the birds find attractive. They would produce copious nectar, which rewards the birds, and they will have deep tubes to accommodate the hummingbirds' long bills and tongues. In contrast, the population on the other side of the mountain may find its pollinator situation reversed. Few hummingbirds, but many bees. And there, the flowers will, will evolve to attract bees. Uh, they may become pink, which, be, which uh, bees favor. They may evolve shallow nectar tubes with less nectar to accommodate the bees' short tongues. And uh, they may be, have flatter flowers, so the petals will form as a landing platform. So eventually, the two populations would diverge in the form of their flowers and amount of their nectar, and each would be specialized for pollination by only a single type of animal. So given time, the species of flowers, while once the same, will suddenly find themselves in new environments with new needs, needs that need to be met in order to survive. They need to be cross-pollinated. One side of the mountain has bees, the other side has more birds. So they will evolve to meet those environmental conditions separately. Over time, they will become distinct species in that they cannot, they cannot cross-pollinate with each other if they were, hypothetically, let's say, brought back together. And this happens uh, with human beings, for instance. We have human populations that, you know, millennia ago separated from each other across vast geologic barriers. And think of the, uh, let's say, the uh, Filipino people versus the uh, Inuit people in northern Canada. Well, in this day and age, you know, well, they, they're obviously very different looking, but in this day and age, we can let's say, bring them together with, um, I don't know, Match.com or something, and they can interbreed. Um, so they're people from around the world, no matter where they're from, they can still interbreed. Um, Homo sapiens sapiens, no matter what you know, racial background they're from. I guess if, if, if many, many thousands or maybe even millions of more years had passed where they were, they were isolated uh, from each other, speciation may have occurred in humanity and indeed it has in the past we'll see that i think in the next chapter but that is how speciation occurs uh, mainly uh, this brings up a few problems with me for instance um, uh, coin does not bring this up in this book but there is such a thing as ring species where you have for instance uh, seagulls that are around the uh, the perimeter of the arctic ocean and you have a starting point where the seagull has a certain shape, form, what have you. And as you go, let's say, counterclockwise around the perimeter of the Arctic Ocean, those seagulls will gradually change, but very slowly, until you get back to a, your starting point, and those seagulls, while adjacent to each other, don't resemble each other. Is that a continuum? How does that work? Because they're not geographically isolated. Um, so that's an interesting problem that I wish Coyne had addressed in this book. I, I did read that in other books, but I never thought about it in terms of geographical distribution. Oh, wow, my time is almost up. There's so much more in this chapter. Um, highly recommend it. This chapter shows a lot about how speciation occurs, what it is, um, how it relates to uh, humanity, uh, what problems are in, are, there are in... Uh, trying to find species in fossils because we see um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, gender dimorphism where males have more prominent features than females in some animals. So are some fossils species or separate species because they're different or is it just a male that is more prominent than the female? Um, these are very difficult issues. Uh, speciation is, is, is a difficult problem. Then, so... So there you go. Um, take care.